Hey. All right. Today we are talking about recovering the arts. So, by the way, those pens, nothing, I've never seen anything make someone as paranoid as that. <laughs> That's tremendous. Who, who started that? Nobody knows? It's fantastic. He's a hero. Okay. So, first, the premise of today's talk is God cares about good art. Don't know what he thinks about bad art, but he's the creator of the universe and all he's ever done is make amazing art. And because, as we learned yesterday, we're image bearers, we are called to be as him. And if God makes good art, we should make good art too. Now the next slide I'm about to show is a radical, it's a radical viewpoint. And a lot of people don't agree with it. But I believe that God is glorified in your leisure time. So when you're with the families and you take the family, uh, when you're with your family and you go take the family to go see a movie, or you're sitting at home and you're watching Netflix, I believe that God is glorified in the time you take to be entertained. I believe there's a value to that. And I think as a result of production and work being easier, the fact that instead of taking a horse to work, we can just drive there, it's given people a lot of free time. And we have to think as Christians, how do we glorify God in our free time? How do we glorify God by being entertained? What is entertainment? What is Christian entertainment? What should the Christian view of the arts be? And to start off with that, um, Christians have always asked that question, by the way. Uh, John Bunyan had to deal with that question in the beginning of Pilgrim's Progress. He was, I guess there were some YouTube trolls about Pilgrim's Progress or something, and they were making comments about why he would waste time on making fiction. And he says, which way it pleases God for who knows how, better than he that taught us first to plow, to guide our mind and pens for his design. And he makes base things usher in divine. So this is his apology. It's at the beginning of Pilgrim's Progress. It's him defending fiction as a literature that glorifies God. And I believe that, uh, I believe that all sorts of art forms can glorify God. And uh, s uh, s even if the art form currently today is used for evil, that doesn't mean that the art itself is bad. Uh, Spurgeon said this, unfortunately, Such has been the moral condition of the theater for many a year that it has become too bad for mending. And even if it were mended, it would soon become corrupt again. That is not a valuable view of arts. That is a view of arts that doesn't allow for Christians to be culture makers and to be influencers and to be uh, Raphael's and amazing artists again. Just because wicked men do wicked things with material objects or, or things in the natural doesn't mean that the system itself is corrupt. Uh, this is a quote from Leonard Raver Ravenhill that says, Entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. Now, to be fair, when he said this, he was talking about entertainment in church. So some clarifications. When I speak about art and entertainment, I'm not speaking about violating the regular principle of worship. There's corporate worship and there's individual worship. And individual worship is stuff we do throughout the week, whether it's with our hands or work or families or whatever. But corporate worship is different. So we are not, when we're talking about movies and music and creating great art, we're not talking about bringing that into corporate worship. This is, you have freedom as a Christian outside of corporate worship to worship God with your hands any way that God has given you the desire to do so. And so that... that so he's speaking about this, but the reason I bring the quote up anyway is because you'll see this quote a lot on your YouTube comment section. So people will love to throw this out. It's uh, really, it's, it's ridiculous. So I put this up there. So when you see that quote and somebody says your YouTube video is a uh, devil substitute for joy, you can just say, well, he was speaking about the context of, of the local church. So 
what has happened in the past 50 or 60 years that we don't have amazing Christian television series? Where's the C.S. Lewis of Christian television shows? There aren't any. And I would like, uh, I would think that a lot of that has to do with an attitude like this. Uh, so enjoy this. Is Mario on? Is Mario on? On the Mac. Good. Brother Brown, the television, I know it's ruining. It's putting an ungodly, worldly atmosphere in our home. But there's nothing I can do. You say, well, what can I do? Well, some night when she's cooking supper and man, everything's getting grilled in there and your children sitting around here like a bunch of catfish at the end of a drain pipe soaking up all of that filth. You just sneak yonder into the garage and you get you. <laughs> and, I, and you come back and while your wife's are cooking, you say, children, you may want to move back a little bit. And you take this thing. <laughs> You say, I hate that thing. I hate that thing. I hate that thing. I hate that thing. That is, that's a real life YouTube troll right there. That's, ex that's, that's the comment section of YouTube right there. So, uh, yeah. That's been the prevailing attitude of Christians for the past 50 or 60 years when it comes to the television. And if you notice what he says there, he says, I hate that ungodly thing. There's no such thing as ungodly things. That's Gnosticism. That says that material things are evil. And that's not, that's a heresy. The TV itself is a good and valuable tool. Facebook is a good and valuable tool. So is YouTube, computers, technology. The question is, how do we use those tools to glorify God? Anybody here uh, a particular fan of guns? All right, good, okay. So what if I told you, hey, guns are used for killing people. We should get rid of guns. You'd be like, huh, that's the ridiculous. Guns have a valuable purpose, and it's to kill people. <laughs> when when it's, the time is right, right? So, so, so you, don't, you don't throw away the ungodly thing. You don't, you don't cost something ungodly because people do evil things with it. And that's been the prevailing view of arts that, that Christians have had to defend themselves against for years and years. And it's time that we stop. So one of the things we wanted to do is we want, at Apologia Studios is we wanted to create a sort of a show that we could just something that we needed something that we could just practice script writing, practice a scripted series. So one of the things we did is called The Studio. Has anybody seen that? It's on our YouTube channel. There's some people. All right. So it's, I think there's maybe 12 episodes, and it's, it's like The Office meets Apologia Studios. So it's just, uh, it's, it's not evangelistic, it's just good, clean comedy, and uh, Christians on YouTube hate that sort of thing, and it says, I am unsure why pastors are wasting their valuable time with this silliness. I was always taught that one of the main jobs of the pastor is to display personal holiness to his congregation. So somehow... In Christianity, we've discovered that pastors can't even laugh and tell a joke because that would not be holy. And that's a very twisted view of holiness. So, um, this is what Phil Graham Riken says in his book, Art for God's Sake, A Call to Recover the Arts. Arts has tremendous power to shape culture and touch the human heart. Its artifacts embody the ideas and desires of the upcoming generation. This means that what is happening in the arts today is prophetic of what will happen in our culture tomorrow. It also means that when Christians abandon the artistic community, we lose a significant opportunity to communicate Christ to our culture. How come there are no good Christian movies. Actually, just should, real quick, just everybody shout out all at once, what's your favorite movie? Okay. Logan. Somebody said Logan. Okay, you sinner. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. The point is that, that most of the time when we say our first movie, it's not a Christian movie. It's not God's Not Dead. Somebody asked me why I have a Somebody asked me why I have God's Not Dead bracelet if I, if I hate the movie so much. And the reason is because 
it reminds me of what not to make. <laughs> and to abandon that line of thinking. I, I really, there's nobody on the planet that hates Christian television more than me. And I work in Christian television. So the reason I do that is because somebody needs to go in there and change it. So there's art in the garden. We're going to get into why God cares so much about art and good art. And this is in Genesis 2, 11 through 12. We're going back to the garden. And this is this weird passage in Genesis 2, 11 that I'm pretty sure pastors don't really preach on much. But it says, it's talking about the rivers that are coming into the Garden of Eden. And it says, the name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx and stone are there. And I want you to just focus, let's focus on the fact that gold, delium, and onyx are there. Those are elements used for beauty, right? Uh, those are elements that are, are used for incense, gold and incense. Where God dwells, there's beauty. God, God makes it so that, that these, these items that are used for crafting, uh, just anointing things. So if, if, if Adam cut down a bench, a tree, and he made a bench... He would craft and anoint the bench in gold in the garden because that's what you use it. And then he would, he would uh, use um, incense to, to even intensify the fragrances of the garden so that when God comes and Adam walks with God, he can point to God and show him the things he's done to beautify his garden. So Adam's first role really was an artist. His first task was a creative task if we go uh, here in Ezekiel, it says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. So there's, there's beauty in this garden. There's minerals and there's, there's, there's valuables that can be used for uh, creating an economy. And, and, and gold and, and, and all, these, all these different things that can just be used for decorating and anointing. They don't serve a purpose as tools. Right? So anybody play Minecraft? Okay, some people. A gold, a gold sword is not that useful. Right? Crafting a sword out of gold is not that useful. And the same, same is true here. You can't make tools out of these things. So this is what Andy Crouch says. He says, what is the point of this list of precious natural resources? Note that they are not primarily useful minerals or substances. The text does not say that the land of Havilah was good, has good iron, granite, and bauxite. These are substances whose only real value is in their beauty. God has located the garden in a place where the natural explorations of its human cultivators will bring them into contact with substances that will invite the creation of beauty. So, notice that these, these minerals in the garden were used for creative purposes. Richard Gaffin says again, the Garden of Eden was very good. It was not very best. That was man's role is to beautify the garden. Genesis 2.19, now out of the ground the Lord God has formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and uh, every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called them, called every living creature, that was its name. Adam's first task was a creative task. It wasn't redemptive, it wasn't evangelistic. It was just to name animals creatively as he pleased and God uh, allowed Adam to do that. And so now we go to the temple. Moses said to the congregation of the people of Israel, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord, who, whoever is of generous heart. Let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linens, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lights, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense and onyx stones. And and stones for the setting of the ephod and for the breastplate. So notice what we see here. We see gold, silver, bronze, onyx, and incense. Uh, God dwelled in the garden and there was onyx, gold, and incense. God dwells in the temple and there's gold, onyx, and incense. God dwells in beauty. And then in Matthew 2.11 it says... And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening the treasures, they offered him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. God was given on earth beauty, art, gold, incense. So, 
We see beauty in the garden. Why? God dwells there. We see beauty in the temple. Why? Because God dwells there. Beauty is gifts to Jesus because God is here. So then we get to Revelation. It says, The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold. Like clear glass, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth cornelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the, the tenth something, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. I picked the worst passages for this talk. It's the most difficult. So, but you see all these jewels and emeralds. This is the new heavens, the new earth. And again, God dwells in a place of beauty. So, there's beauty, in the, beauty on the new earth. Why? Because God dwells there. We know that God doesn't dwell in temples anymore. He dwells among his people in covenant community. So then, let's beautify the earth. And uh, I'm going to show you why this is important. So in Exodus 35, we have probably one of the greatest artists in all the Bible. And it says, this is, this is uh, Bezalel. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called his name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs. I want, it's very important that we know those things. He was filled with the Spirit of God. He's filled with skill. He's filled with intelligence, with knowledge, with craftsmanship, all of those things to devise artistic designs. And then he can, uh, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Moholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twin li twine linen or by a weaver or by any sort of workman or skilled designer. So we see here, we have two artists that are instructed to help create this temple. And not only were they instructed to do it, God gave them the ability to do it. So if we want to say, hey, I want to be a Christian artist, what are the, ad what are the skill sets that a Christian artist should have I think, we see, I think we see it here, and we're going we're to go through these. We're going to go through all these attributes and show why they're important. So, Phil Riken says, When God calls us to do something, we are to trust that he, is also, he will also give us whatever we need to fulfill that calling. And so God, first off, filled him with the Spirit of God. Why did he fill Bezalel and Aholiab with the Spirit of God? Because worldview matters in your art. Worldview is important. There is no neutrality. There's no such thing as a blob of paint on the wall that doesn't mean anything according to the artist. He was having a bad day. He spilled the can of paint. That's what it meant. And he sold it for a million bucks. <laughs> By the way, have you guys ever been to the Smithsonian Museum of Modern Art in DC? If you ever go there, it's really depressing. Like, I went there one time, and on, on the floor, there's a black pallet, and there's a white wooden pallet. They're just two wooden pallets, black and white. And they have a space in the museum. Right? Humanist art is dumb. <laughs> it's not very skilled. It's not creative. It's, uh, it's, it's used as a way to challenge what art is. And uh, so even that stuff is... is is, is, is in opposition to God in the sense that they say art doesn't have to mean anything. And that's not true with, uh, at all because there is no neutrality. So, and we'll get into this more, but this is, this is from, uh, who wrote this, huh? Oh, this is from Table Talk Magazine, okay. For Christians to influence the world with truth of God's word requires the recovery of the great Reformation doctrine of vocation. Christians are called to God's service not only in church professions, but also in every calling. The task of restoring truth to the culture depends largely on our lay people. 
To bring back truth on a practical level, the church must encourage Christians to be merely consumers of culture, but not just uh, merely consumers of culture, but makers of culture. The church needs to cultivate Christian artists, musicians, novelists, filmmakers, journalists, attorneys, teachers, scientists, business executives, and the like, teaching its lay people the sense in which every vocation, including above all, the callings of husband, wife, and parent, is a sphere of Christian ministry and a way of serving God and neighbor that is grounded in God's truth. Christian lay people must be encouraged to be leaders in their fields rather than eager to please followers working from the assumptions of their biblical worldview, not the vapid cliches of culture. So we need leaders of our field, not just people who are satisfied working at McDonald's minimum wage and not wanting to advance up and, and, and to, to get pay increases and move into management but are just satisfied with the minimum wage. We need people who are willing to work hard to be the best and, and, and to take over the world. So, and notice down here it says not to, uh, to work, we, we should work from the assumptions of our biblical worldview, not the vapid cliches of pop culture. So that's very important that we work according to our worldview. And this affects the art. So, Michelangelo, humanist art, right? Michelangelo was seen as the perfect man. He had giant hands for working. Man was great. Man was awesome. And this is how Michelangelo, uh, this is how he, man was portrayed. And then we get to Reformation art, and we have stuff like Rembrandt. And Rembrandt has warts on his face. He has wrinkles in his eyes. He's older and he's got gray hair. And a lot of Rembrandts were that way. So why? Well, humanism is not what influenced Reformation art. The scriptures did. So how does the scriptures view man? The scriptures view man as totally depraved and sin and death. But the problem is, who was buying and paying for the humanist art? The Catholic Church who also has a uh, humanist worldview, that man can save himself. So the humanist art was the primary art of that time. So again, worldview matters even in your art. So with skill, this is the thing I think Christians uh, care the least about when it comes to art. I think for the main, the, the main reason Christian films are so bad is because they realize they can make them as cheaply and as poorly as possible and people will still buy them and they'll make a lot of profit. But they don't ever invest that profit back into making great films. They, 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 they just use it to, to wash the Christian retail industry with just these films, these cheap films, as many cheap films as we can possibly make and we'll make money on them because Christians are going to buy stuff no matter what. And that's true. Uh, when, when you talk about Lifeway bookstores or the Christian retail industry, you're talking about a group of people who only buy things, if it, the, the retailer only buys things for the store to sell, if it only appeals to 35-year-old uh, soccer moms. That's their main target audience. So soccer moms just want stuff they can just put on the DVD player and let their kids be entertained and they don't have to worry about cussing and swearing and stuff like that. So there really isn't a purpose in making great art, but the problem is that Lifeway and the Christian bookstore industry are the main financers of that sort of thing. So that's why we have really poor Christian art. So something to know, pagan arts have great skill and terrible theology, and Christian arts have great theology with terrible skill. And I don't think uh, either one of those glorify God. I think in order for art to be good art, it has to be good, it has to be true, it has to be theologically true, and it has to be uh, done. It has to be done with great skill. So, so I had this Facebook conversation with this guy a long time ago, and he sent me a message, and he goes, "Hey, man, I make music, and I would love." for you to put some of your music in the backgrounds of your videos and use it to edit my videos. And so I was like, okay, I, I get those messages a lot. So I always say the same thing back and I say, awesome, well let me hear it and if it meets our standards, we'll use it, we'd be happy to use it. And uh, he responded back and he got mad and angry and he was like, how dare you 
say that as a Christian if it meets our standards. That's prideful and arrogant and you're speaking like the world when you talk that way. Which is crazy to think that Christians shouldn't have standards for their art or, or Christians shouldn't have standards for anything really. Could you, could you imagine if I said, you know, you're really placing a lot of standards uh, on how you raise your family and you shouldn't do that. Right? That'd be silly. So the same thing, or, or you know, you're really trying too hard at your job. You should stop. Like, that's ridiculous. Right? So, so, when you, so he, he got mad, and so he was like, why don't you speak to me like a Christian? Okay. This is what I said. I said, let me make sure your music glorifies God and doesn't blaspheme his creative nature by being less than worthy of the vocation which you are called as an image bearer of the king. So then he goes, oh, that's better. Then he got it. So the point is that we are, to, we are called to make amazing things. And one of the things I like to ask is, does your art, artwork lie about Jesus? You're an image bearer. You're called to reflect Jesus. So does your artwork lie about him? Does your skill lie about what Christ uh, commands. Uh, we're going to go into a lot more into this later this week, but do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. There's reasons secular artists make tons of money and then they're invited to the White House to perform. It's because they're good at their work. Their theology and their worldview is awful. But their skill and their talent and their dedication to their craft surpasses pretty much all Christian artists that I know. They're, they're, they're sold out, right? They're going to hell for this. <laughs> so, so they dedicate everything they have for it. And we're, and, and we're, we're going to heaven. We're going to worship with God for eternity, the creator of all things. And when it comes to art, we're just like, eh, you know. Let's just tell the same story over and over and over again where there's a kid and there's a bully and the bully bullies him. But eventually at the end of the movie, the bully gets saved. Everybody's happy. Amen. Roll credits. Right? We've heard that story over and over and over again. There's far more stories. And, and God, in his book of Proverbs, says that a, a, a skillful man will, will stand before kings. If you want your wor our, our arts, if we do good things, if we do good work, We'll be able to influence presidents. We'll be invited to the White House. We'll be invited to dine with kings. And so that's a very important reason to, to, to have your art be skillful. Francis Schaeffer says, We are not being true to the artist as a man if we consider his artwork junk simply because we prefer with his outlook on life. Christian schools, Christian parents, and Christian pastors often have per, uh, turned off young people uh, at, at just this point, because the schools, the pastors, and the parents did not make a distinction between technical excellence and content, the whole of much great art has been rejected with scorn and ridicule. Instead, if the artist's technical excellence is high, he has to be praised for this. Even if we defer with his worldview, man must be treated fairly as man. So we can see a movie like Logan, like that guy did, and we can say that was a brilliant movie. It was written really well. It, there was a sinful humanist worldview in it, but everything else, the production, the lighting, the quality, all that was magnificent. And the same we should be able to do with Christians. We should say, you know, theology in that movie was really good, but it sucked. Like, we should be able to tell people that. And we need to do that. We need to encourage people to be film critics. This is why they were filled with intelligence and with knowledge. So the Bible says, by wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding he set knowledge. Uh, by, by understanding he set by the heavens in place. By his knowledge the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. Proverbs 3, 19 through 20. So God creates with wisdom. But we should also be wise in how we critique art. Uh, Anybody, are y'all familiar with uh, Roger Ebert? He was a film critic. Um, he was one of the most prolific film critics, probably one of the best film critics in history. He could determine the worldview of a director based on how they lit the set. Now, he was an adamant atheist. He was an atheist all the way up to the point where he died. But he said, the purpose of film criticism 
is to encourage good film and to discourage bad film. I think we should have Christian film critics that discourage bad Christian films. And a, a while back ago, I made a movie. Have you, anybody, have you guys seen my movie, Babies Are Murdered Here? So I did a movie called Babies Are Murdered Here. It's free on YouTube. You can go and watch it. Um, and it's a documentary about abortion. And when we made the movie, we put it free on YouTube. And we were trying to get people to write about it. We were like, please say something about this movie. And there weren't any Christian film critics. So, you know, you have people like, uh, you know, Tim Challies or, uh, you know, they do book reviews. But when it comes to movie reviews, they don't really give them the same weight as they would the writing of a book. They, they'll, they'll just examine the theological top content of a movie. So we found that it was really hard to get people to review our movies. So we started a website and we called the website gospelspam.com. And the reason was because somebody asked on a, their Facebook page, a popular Christian uh, speaker was asking about presuppositional apologetics on their Facebook page. And a fan of ours shared how to answer the fool as a discussion on presuppositional apologetics. And the guy responded and said, please don't spam my page with this. And we were like, wait a minute. You were asking for a discussion on presuppositional apologetics. This is a movie on presuppositional apologetics. So we thought of the name Gospel Spam. And we were invited. We, we started doing film reviews. And we were invited to go see. My friend John Speed was invited to go see this pastoral preview of a, a movie that came out. And so he did. And he went. And he hated the movie. And he rightfully destroyed the movie in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a review, as it should have been. And we got a phone call from the director of that movie. And uh, I did, actually. <laughs> I got chewed out. And I, I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to this phone call. Uh, and I, I want you to just think, is this the attitude Christians should take when they're criticized for their lack of skill in, in a filmmaking. You gotta take the repent, man. You need to look inside and repent. We have worked so hard on our films with working with no resources and people expect us to turn miracles. It's ridiculous how you got, and I don't want you to write a review. Listen, we don't give a dick. If you want to review the movie, you pay in the theater to watch it and then you review it all you want. But you don't go to a free preview and write a review and shoot the movie down. That is unchristian. And you need to give me John Speed's number. He ought to be mad enough to talk to me about this. He needs to talk to me about this, okay? We're going to have a conversation. And I want to see if John knows the Lord. Now, if you love me, you won't write a review, okay? It's wrong. It's wrong. You should have paid to see that movie. Send me ten bucks if you want to make me happy. You need to get saved, brother. You need to come to the Lord. You gotta get on the right side of the, of the game here, okay? Just leave me alone. Don't hurt what we're doing. Don't stand against us. You show me something you've done, okay? I don't even see you in the marketplace. So who the heck are you, the expert? Well, that is that is a movie. Wait, Marcus, Marcus, you can't make a movie. Well, Roger Ebert wasn't a great filmmaker either, but he was still. Let's see, let's see you and John Speed make a movie. We did. Baby, you I don't even see it. Babies are murdered here. <laughs> Where are you selling it? How many do you sell? Ten? Not even out there. What is your problem, Marcus? Are you a born again believer? Do you know what it is to believe in Jesus? What is your issue? I don't Tell me. I don't think it's fair for you to question my faith because I don't like your movie. All right. I'm done. <laughs> All right. I hope you take heed to what I said. I hope you take heed to the words I said. Right? Like, you write a film review, you critique the movie, as Francis Schaeffer says, to be fair to man as man. And to, to uh, you can talk about the theology being good, and, but the filmmaking itself, the acting was bad. And suddenly, we're not saved anymore. <laughs> so do you understand why we have bad Christian films and bad Christian movies? It's because we just assume that this is like a person... Mo movies, we assume that these movies are like uh, people who preach the gospel. And we say, 
don't attack somebody for preaching the gospel. He's doing the best he can and the God's going to use it. Yes, in that context, yes. And yes, even in bad filmmaking, God is going to use it. But you still expect your pastor to study and to prepare, right? If your pastor is, is buying sermons on the internet, you're going to challenge him and rebuke him and, 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 and tell him to stop, right? And if we're just copying the same scripts as other people, that the same Christian movie genre, the same Christian format over and over and over again, it's like buying your script off the internet. And we need to call them out for that. And so I, I say that because there might be people in here that want to be writers. And if you are a writer, as a filmmaker, I want you to trash my films. I want to be challenged and I want to know that people aren't just telling me they like the movie because it's a Christian movie. I want to know that it's a good movie with good theological content from a good worldview as well. So, and that's why it's important to be film critics because he was inspired him to teach both him and Oholiab. I think this is important because the church really needs to teach Christians how to make the arts. We're to breed artists. Artists should be coming from the church in such a way that the, the idea here is that, that art is a, is, a, is, a, is a business. Art is capitalistic in nature. And although liberals don't want to tell you that, it's true. Uh, art is a form of capitalism. And capitalism is a way to suppress evil in the culture. An example of that would be a few years ago when Chick-fil-A was being persecuted by the radical left for uh, not supporting homosexual marriage. Uh, and what happened? It just went away. Why did it went away? Because they might hate the fact that you don't like homosexuals, but they still love your chicken. <laughs> right? Same thing happened with Duck Dynasty. Duck Dynasty got in a lot of trouble. But people still like the show. Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is still around. So it is a form. The, the uh, commerce is a way to control uh, evil in a society and, 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 to, and, to, and to suppress it. And so when that comes to churches, we need to let people know. We need to, as a church, we need to instruct students how to be great artists. And a lot of times what we do is we say, well, we don't want any drums in our church service, so there's no value for you as a drummer in the world. Right? Or we don't want to use movies in our church service, which we shouldn't, but there's no value for, for you as a filmmaker anywhere else in the world. And we have to figure out a way that we can find our artists who, who might not be, whose skills might not be as useful in in, in the corporate worship setting and find a way that the church can encourage them and motivate them and be there and inspire them to make great art and to build great businesses. This is something else that's important. A Christian should use these arts to the glory of God, but not just as tracks, mind you, but as things of beauty for the praise of God. And artwork can be a doxology in itself. This is really important because we get this all the time. If we have a guest on the show that might not be a Christian, or if we put something on YouTube that's just funny and silly, people go, well, how did that glorify God? There was no gospel of presentation in it. And it doesn't have to have a gospel presentation in it in order to be uh, glorifying to God. So I can prove this by saying, what is the greatest form of art in all of history? And you say, Creation. All creation. The universe is a star is platypuses and porcupines, right? They're amazing pieces of art. However, the Bible says in Romans 1 that the heavens declare the glory of God and leaves men without excuse. But ultimately, the heavens and the earth and the creation are just general revelation. They're not special revelation. So, if you're an artist... I want you to feel free to take pictures, to make paintings, and you don't have to attach a Bible verse to everything. You can just make art for art's sake. And that should give you 
immense amount of freedom. Wedding photographers go and they take wedding photos, but they don't attach Bible verses or make theological explanations of every wedding photo that they take. They just shoot. <laughs> that's all they do. So, so that's, that's, that's what I want to encourage you as artists. This, this should free you up. So uh, this is from Phil Riken. It says, to summarize, this is a Christian view of art. The, art is call, the artist is called and gifted by God who loves all kinds of art, who maintains high aesthetic standards for goodness, truth, beauty, and whose glory is art's highest goal. We accept these principles because they are biblical and also because they are true to God's character. What we believe about art is based on what we believe about God. Art is what it is because God is who he is. So our art should be it should be done with uh, beauty and truth and with skill because that's how God makes art. And we should demand it. As consumers, we should not buy every Christian movie that comes out. We should not go to the theater and see every Christian movie that comes out because it's Christian. We should start, we should start critiquing films with our wallet and protesting bad Christian films. And when you do that, the marketplace is going to respond to that. So, Christians ought not, this is from Francis Schaeffer, Christians ought not to be threatened by fantasy and imagination. A great painting is not photographic. Think of the Old Testament art commanded by God. There were blue pomegranates on the robes of priests who went into the Holy of Holies. In nature, there are no blue pomegranates. Christian artists do not need to be threatened by fantasy and imagination, for they have a basis for knowing the difference between them and the real world out there. The Christian is the really free person. He is free to have imagination. This too is our heritage. The Christian is the one whose imagination should fly beyond the stars. So if you're a writer, photographer, filmmaker, singer, I want you to be encouraged and motivated to make art in a way that glorifies God and not be restrained by false rules that Christian societies and mainly Christian book retailers have placed on you. You do not have to make things that Lifeway says you have to. You do not have to make things that Family Christian Bookstore says you have to. They're out of business now, right? And I think, I think we're going to see that more, especially, this is really important, the fact that you have Facebook and the fact that you have YouTube right now is one of the most momentous technological things since the printing press. I don't think people have realized this yet. And, and because I work every day, in this field on social media broadcasting, I, I, I think we have to understand that we have before us a printing press for film and television right now, the internet. And we haven't used it right. Netflix figured it out. Netflix figured it out. VidAngel figured it out, but they were taken down uh, through the court system. VidAngel, I, anybody use VidAngel? Did you all use that? There's a few people. So essentially what they did was they they realized that uh, they, they, could, they couldn't afford streaming rights to movies. So instead, if you wanted to stream a movie, you had to actually buy it and then you could return it. So they had like warehouses full of DVDs. And then what they did was they cut out the cussing and swearing and nudity in all these programs and you could watch these shows. And um, just, it was, it was pretty amazing. And uh, the courts shut them down. But the point is they realized that they could become a distributor of content in, in Hollywood the distributors are the one with power. ABC, CBS, NBC, Disney, um, um, Miramax, and DreamWorks, and Netflix now. Which, by the way, Netflix has more subscribers than all the cable companies combined right now. And on YouTube, they just surpassed 1 billion hours of viewing a day. So these aren't hard to get into. These aren't hard industries to get into. Netflix needs content. You just have to make something good. YouTube needs content. A billion hours a day, do you know that's 114,000 years? That's how much people watch YouTube every day. So there's an audience for you to make whatever you want, even if it's Calvinist kids in the kitchen or something like that, right? That's the actual thing, right? I said that right? Is it right? 
I did say it right. Okay. Calvinist Kids in the Kitchen. Subscribe on YouTube. Okay. So, so there's a huge market out there for even niche markets on YouTube. And so, let's create things. And um, tomorrow, uh, we're going to talk about the history of the cell phone all the way from the Tower of Babel onto the cell phone and why Christians did it. So, it's going to be awesome. Thank you guys.